And it will be a comment on memory. Uh, the, uh, I suppose what you were giving us was this whole question of the design of a space of memory uh, uh, through uh, the, the changing ideas of uh, the museum, especially in the age of cinema. Mm -hmm. right, so, um, Excellent summary. <laughs> <laughs> Not easy to do. <laughs> And um, the, I want to start just with two quick points. Uh, the, uh, firstly, some of the images you use for memory, which is uh, pleats, uh, pleats uh, uh, fabrics, and, uh, uh, and uh, folds. Yep. Right? Now, uh, if you start with the idea of pleats and, and, and uh, with fabric, one of the things about fabric, of course, is that it's a kind of weaving and interweaving. Right? And the, and, um, uh, and if you take that seriously as a metaphor for memory, then the question of whether memory is, uh, 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 is something material or immaterial mm -hmm. uh, services. Because it's like that the, 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 uh, the weave has all these sort of blank, all these blank spaces mm -hmm. in it, right? And, and it's like that the, the, the fabric is really made up of both the, the uh, uh, the thread and, and the blank spaces uh, um, uh, uh, between that. Now, I think this is true also for the fold, mm -hmm. right, because, and pleats, because sure. uh, pleats are always these sort of uh, blind spots or, or blank spots. And I thought I'd, uh, I'd quote some, uh, throw some lines of poetry at you, sure. which is <laughs> uh, uh, some lines from Wordsworth, who of course deals with memory, and it's, uh, it's the lines from the Ode to in Intimations of Immortality, where he says, uh, and there'll be a question at the end of it, where <laughs> towards the end uh, you have these uh, famous lines where he says, um, what though the radiance that was once so bright be now forever taken from my sight, though nothing can bring back the hour, of splendor in the grass, of glory in the flower, we will grieve not, and so on and so forth, right? Now, I just wanted to focus on that nothing in this quotation, where right? it says, though nothing can bring back the hour of splendor in the grass, of glory in the flower. It's like we can read this nothing in two ways. Right? You read it straight and say, nothing can bring back the hour. So memory, uh, once lost, is lost, right? Or you can say, nothing. Right? It's the nothing, it's the, it's the negativity, mm -hmm. right? That, that uh, 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 has in some paradoxical way a power to conjure up something that is no longer there. So for example, in these lines, right? When one when, when said, though nothing can bring back. And then of course, what follows is that, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the splendor in the grass and glory in the flower is recreated uh, through that nothing. Now, the question here then about memory and collection and recollection would be really this, right, and, and, and cinema. Because it's not as if uh, you can have a collection, mm -hmm. uh, something that's uh, uh, material and out there, mm -hmm. that would itself generate recollections. I mean, if they do, they'll be, to a certain extent, fake recollections. Sure. I mean, there's something much more... Uh, uh, um, Mm -hmm. Right, so that, that's the question, so you might start with that and then I'm sure there'll be other questions for you. Okay, well, um, thank you. Uh, thanks for, well, this is a fascinating question and, and thanks everybody for uh, sticking around and still being here. So I'm, I'm going to try to uh, uh, associate a number of response uh, to this. Um, first of all, um, yes, that's exactly what I was trying to do and then I can elaborate a bit more on this idea of, of, the, of the fabric, of the, the idea of the visual fabric, which is the uh, sort of the, the beginning of this uh, new book that I'm working on that deals with um, pleats of matter and uh, folds of the soul is, mm. is chapter one. So in fact, it goes right back into this uh, notion of weave. Um, now, the, I, I'm very interested in this, in this uh, idea of weaving as a form of as a form of connection between threads uh, and I and I very much agree with you that one needs to take into consideration the, the blind spots or the nothingness or the blackness in a way that it's in between um, it's important to me because I, I do not want a, a, a kind of uh, 
I mean, one of the things that attracts me to the idea of the weave, of the, weave the fold, and the pleat is to find a kind of uh, philosophical uh, metaphor that in, that in fact allows for uh, the blind spot, that allows for the negative, allows for the non-space, that allows for something to happen also in between. That's the other thing that's important is that in a sense, in a weave, uh, is, is not the totalizing effect, but is in fact the way in which the things, the threads connect. Uh, to each other and how much space is left in between and how uh, that space um, really uh, changes the tone itself of the fabric. I mean, and it's, and it's literal in fashion and in fabric. It's one thing um, that one looks at. The other thing that attracts me to this, um, to this particular metaphor of the fabric and, and the weave is, is reversibility. I think in the sense of the negative, as, as you say, there's also uh, reversibility, something that happens in the negative, like the negative in photographic negative or the negative in the cinema is precisely, I think, this blank space of which you're speaking about, which is also a space of the reversible. Uh, when you look at a photographic negative or a cinematic negative, what you see is an image in reverse. Uh, and I'm very interested in this because I don't like totalizing concepts or concepts that can be turned around on themselves, that can be, in a sense, de-assembled uh, or looked at in, a, in, a, in a form, this form of rotation uh, which you spoke of, in the end, to me, is also a form of twisting and, and, uh, and reversibility. Uh, pleats, in particular. Uh, uh, Ise Miyake's uh, clothes being uh, the utmost, uh, uh, the same materialization of, of a Deleuzian uh, concept, is when you look at pleats uh, folded, you realize that there is, the reversibility also indicates that there's no difference between exterior of a fabric and an interior of a fabric, uh, because they look the same. Uh, in regular fabric, sometimes you see the inside, but when you have pleats, in fact, how do you know what's inside and what's outside? So this form of reversibility is also a form of permeability and a form of reversal between inside and outside, which is important to my notion of projection. And uh, design your design as a project, which is also a projection. So blank space as the photographic space, which also, it's a space, I mean, if you think of the metaphor cinematically, the one that you, um, that you suggested is also the way, it's, it's the emergence of the image itself. I mean, the part of the chemical process of celluloid is in fact that the image emerges out of the blank yeah. space, out of that darkness. And the blank space, the darkness, is also important to the darkness of the movie theater. Um, so there is, in a sense, a, a lot to be said about uh, this idea and, and the idea also of, of reversibility. I should make also more clear um, that this also refers, if not li literally, to um, a, an idea developed by Deleuze in a, f in a fabulous little book that he wrote called The Fold, uh, which actually uh, is a philosophical uh, concept that he develops around the fold that comes from architecture and design. Uh, it's one of the uh, few cases in which he refers directly to a form of design. He begins the book by talking about the Baroque house and the design of the Baroque house as having this kind of reversible uh, interior, uh, an interior which is draped by curtains, uh, which are yet another architecture that pleads, look at this, and that separates, but also connects inside and outside. And that also blanks space out, but also illuminates space. So all of these kinds of spatial uh, metaphors, architectural metaphors are for me uh, places of this form of permeability and reversibility and, and emergence of, 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 of fabrics of different kinds of ways of thinking. Um, last but and not least about the blind spots. Uh, and memory, which you uh, addressed in, in your question. I, I, years ago, I, I was interested in psychoanalysis and then, and then it went uh, out of my trajectory. And it's coming back in by a strange uh, refashioning of imagining. I mean, after all, memory is a blind spot. Mm. In, in many ways, it's not, in fact, something full. 
Uh, and it's interesting when it is indeed connected to some unconscious emergence of something that comes out of nothingness. Uh, mm -hmm. So the nothingness is not because nothing can replace it, but because in fact it is very much connected to that form of darkness out of which in many ways things emerge and go back into. So the blind spot, I think it also has a connection to blind spots of memory. Um, memory as in fact being uh, blind spots. Um, um, the, and I'm thinking of a popular mm. example in that film, uh, uh, what was it called, spotless of, uh, something, I like to call blind spots of the, yeah, I think, what, what was it? Eternal sunshine of the spotless mind, <laughs> perfect, which was actually kind of, it was actually a, quite of an interesting film in many ways because it imagined ways in which one could zap away the memory, and the memory would in fact disintegrate into that form of nothingness out of which they appear. So it was almost a form of like, and, and somehow when somebody was resisting, it felt as if the ruins of memory were there emerging out of the blindness uh, that of, the, of the spotless mind, in fact. Um, and last but not least, the connection between blind spots and, and cinema. I've been thinking a lot about the relation um, between uh, uh, the digital image and the, and the, and the celluloid and the, and the filmic image um, in this notion of, of, of the, the death of cinema or the post-cinema. And one of the things that, that fascinates me is that in many ways when, the, well, when you look at a cinematic image and when you experience a cinematic image, one of the things that happen is the flicker. And the flicker goes through a blank space. It goes through a negative space. It goes through a, a, even a black space at a certain point. And one of the one of the things that hypnotizes, interestingly enough, uh, but also creates hysteria uh, in some form, to which cinema is connected. Both hysteria and hypnosis are both uh, are both, in a sense, uh, expression of that, that form of uh, imaging. It has something to do. With, with, that, uh, with that flicker, with that, negative, with that negative space. And it's also something that somehow um, activates uh, certain forms of, of suspension of consciousness, uh, daydreaming uh, that happens in film, which is the closest state that you have to uh, places where memory emerge. I mean, after all, the unconscious works in cinema as it works in memory. And I think it, in, in, the, in that particular technology, it's actually the technology is directly connected to uh, the use of a blank, uh, a blank space or a blind spot or a dark space. So it's, it's actually deeply, uh, I mean, you make me think of how deeply uh, involved it is in the fabric right. of what I'm saying. Thank and thank you for okay. that question. Um, uh, Philip, and then, go ahead. Thank you so much for just a, a really eye-opening presentation. Um, I was thinking throughout of kind of ways to maybe inflect some of what you were saying with um, examples of recent artistic practice in China. And one piece that I keep coming back to, or two pieces by the same artist, uh, Yang Fudong, uh, a Shanghai uh, essentially artist and filmmaker, um, I think touch very directly on, mm -hmm. on some of the things you've just raised, particularly this idea of uh, of the blank spot or the nothingness of cinema. Um, I remember a piece he did in 2004, which essentially consisted of an architectural labyrinth that the viewer would 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 kind of traverse, coming to the center. Um, this enclosed, you know, almost a parody of a white cube kind of space, um, paranoid sorts of dimensions, one screen shaped void cut into the space which looked, this was at a very upscale gallery on the bun, so actually offering a view through this sort of pseudo viewfinder back out onto the river and the ships going by um, with a camera then projecting this film of essentially genericized Chinese memory of two boys playing, a kind of typical childhood scene um, in broad daylight and so it was the film projected without, with the absence of the screen which this, I mean if you take the screen back to the sheet back to you know text, which comes from text, that which comes from you know the word to weave, as you know, as a, a Latinist. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know. It, 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 it actually raised something for me about kind of the absence of the endpoint of projection or the surface of projection, um, and where how we might think from that towards um, the space, uh, kind of elaborated by the distance between the projector and the screen, and that space as a political space, possibly. Um, and, and the thing, the, mm. the, the way this connects kind of to the second piece is that the only other thing in this empty space at the center of this labyrinth 
was actually a, a projectionist um, from a roving projection team, as were very common in you know basically Chinese s small cities and factories after 1949. And that's a giant part of the filmic tradition here is kind of the experience of watching a film outdoors in a public space mm. shown you know by um, someone from a very specialized kind of team who's you know sort of delegated to and sent you know across different formulations of space to come to a certain place to project this film. Um, he, he just last, a few months ago actually, at another a private museum here in Shanghai, uh, did a show that consisted of nine filmic loops, which were, in, and this goes back to what you were saying about the, um, the loop as a form of recurring mm. recollection, uh, haunting the gallery now, and connects actually to the other projects you were mentioning by artists like uh, Chantal Ackerman and kind of other yeah. contemporary stars. I mean, he's often mentioned in that context internationally, which is kind of one reason why it's interesting. But this essentially uh, constructed archive, which consisted of these nine films, which were actually kind of all depicting, I don't know if people have seen his work, but he's kind of known for these kind of iconically Shanghainese kinds of scenes. His iconic work is uh, Seven Intellectuals in a Bamboo Forest, which is a five-part cycle, and it's, it's black and white, and it's misty, and it's kind of picking up on Shanghai film and other things. Anyway, the point being that like he, he, he took these three minute scenes mm -hmm. and actually had done nine takes or 10 takes of each so that they were actually loops within loops, right? So you had uh, the scene repeated again and again and again, but actually as one continuous take. Um, and then that looped in over itself and again with these projectionists there. So I, I just, I think it's just a, this idea of problematizing the, this idea of, um, of the of the space of projection as maybe one way to get back to kind of the bigger social questions here. Mm -hmm. uh, the, that was the seven intellectuals. That was I think that's down now. But yeah. this was important to me to come because I'd like to mo to know more and I'd like to actually uh, connect uh, things more than I have. And, and so I, I'm I mean I'm going to ask you later to uh, spell it for me and find it. Uh, and I want to comment a little bit on on this notion of the surface of projection, uh, which is exactly, in a, in a sense, what I'm trying um, to, uh, to get at uh, with some of these, uh, some of these ideas, so to talk about projection as a project of, of, of speaking of something other than uh, what it has been looked at, which is to say um, the, the kind of um, experience of Renaissance uh, perspective. You know, some of the problems, I think, with projection uh, the way in which it was theorized in, in film theory uh, for a great many 20 years has had to do with the fact that the screen was looked at as, a, uh, as an equivalent of the kind of window which was the frame of Renaissance uh, perspective and therefore this form of spectating was a kind of centralized uh, spectator that was immaterial sitting outside uh, in many ways of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the projection itself. And I'm much more interested in, in thinking of, this, of, the, of the screen less as a window and less as a mirror, but, but something of a fabric, itself and a fabric, because if you think about it, in many ways, also the first projections were sheets. I mean, I'm going back to this idea. Were actually literally sheets uh, put up, where in a sense this kind of magic of projection of light, and they were also movable. I mean, one of the things that I think these installations that you're mentioning, and in general, some of the installations that problematize this notion of projection is the permeability uh, of the space between an inside and an outside. And the idea of projecting outward, which you were mentioning in the work of this interesting artist, of, of breaking open the walls of the theater, in a sense, and including the city. If I understand, you know, I haven't seen it, it's hard to, but you've made a very good description of it. Um, uh, seems very, very interesting to me uh, in, in that way, as a, as a way of rethinking, much as the loop, uh, in some form, also rethinks questions of time. You had something there about, I mean, what I can offer in response to the idea of also relating it um, to a, pos a possible form of, of political uh, or social redesign uh, of space. Um, one artist that I'm interested in very much who seems to be doing this, whose work I didn't uh, uh, show here because uh, I already threw a lot of information at you and I, I, I just we didn't want to cover the universe, but it's Krzysztof Wodicko, um, who's a, a Polish artist living in New York, who's doing a number of installations which actually appear to 
uh, in spirit have something in common to the uh, Chinese artist you were mentioning. Um, and uh, he has a piece uh, at the Venice Biennale uh, this year in the, in the Polish pavilion, which I thought was really extraordinary, uh, that, I, that, I, that I actually am writing about uh, for something else. Um, and what he does is, is something that appears uh, to do a kind of architectural reimagination of the work of the screen as, as a fabric of intersection between the public and the private, uh, and again, this form of public intimacy and sort of projection and reversal. So you walk into a, an in, inside space of a gallery, and what you think you're seeing is windows. Uh, but these windows are, in fact, screens. So the wall is a window, and it's also a cinematic screen. And what you're looking at uh, uh, is actually looking through that appears to be looking at the outside of the gallery where apparently people uh, that are living in the city of New York or Rome, he's done a, a number of projects in different cities in the world, are speaking or uh, hanging out uh, in classic fashion. Now, uh, nobody can smoke anymore in the inside, so a lot of people are smoking. And while they are, they're talking. And most of these people are workers or people are working in buildings or workers of the building. And so there's a kind of social commentary also about the ethnicity and the difference of of the kind of social characters that exist in the, in the public of a city and the viewer of the, art, of the art gallery and the art space. And so through this permeable, in a sense, curtain window screen, you're projected something that projects a social form of interaction and also is a kind of eavesdropping in a way in a world that's usually uh, entirely, uh, entirely separate. And so the, uh, and, and it's also, I think, aesthetically, tremendously interesting because you see it as if you was a, an actual, it, you see it as a kind of evanescent projection of the outside into the inside, bleeding uh, both between the two. So I think these kinds of explorations are very interesting to me in, in breaking uh, boundaries and of the outside and the inside and social space and interior space and in, in, in forms of public intimacy. And I was looking to see if I, I don't think I transferred my Venice Biennale pictures in here yet, but um, I probably didn't. Let me see, I might have done it. Uh, Venice Biennale, how about? I have it. Ah, I got him. <laughs> here he is. Christoph. Uh, let's see if this one. I don't know what it came up one of these. Yeah. Uh, oh. yeah. That's, um, that's, an, no, that, that's not him, that's another, that's, um, actually it's interesting, that's Grazia Tadini, an Italian artist who's doing something quite similar, uh, a, a window screen in which you see projected something that looks like the cosmos, the universe, uh, but is in fact also, uh, the, uh, also the landscape of a city, and that, that bleeds in and, and, and totally changes. Um, now, well, uh, I, didn't, I didn't imagine I was going to do this, so it's not organized. I apologize. Yeah, see if, I'll try one more, see if it doesn't show. Uh, no, that's another thing. No. Uh, OK, why don't well, we go on to it. the, We'll yeah. go on back to another, yeah. I'll keep looking. Uh, all right, there's Simon. a cue. Oh, so, um, um, I would like for you, um, if possible, to address um, another kind of spatial uh -huh. arrangement in terms of the convergence of museum and cinema. Is, which is the issue or question of subjectivity and spectatorship, mm -hmm. which is like the act of seeing or the different ways of seeing, a question um, also inspired by, by a painting, uh, Manet's Dejeuner sur le Lab, um, who's looking at what and then what memory, whose memory, duration of the memory, etc. And it's also a question of permanency and then the transient nature of the, the image or objects in terms of the number of frames per second that flash through our eyes, um, which also get registered in our, um, on our memory, on our brain, while the museum experience is quite, quite different in terms of the process of generating memory. That way when we go to the individual display frames and then um, kind of which generates certain types of memory rather than um, different images. Uh, flashing through our eyes um, in, say, 24 uh, frames per second. 
So just, um, if you can maybe address a little bit about the different uh, ranges of mobilization of the subject object relationship or positionings afforded um, in the museum and cinema experience. And second one is related in terms of the, the blank spaces. And you mentioned the Eisenstein's idea about, mm -hmm. about uh, mobility. And then um, um, I would like for you to, to say a little bit about the, um, the relationship between frames, which is um, the, well, not the big theme for Eisenstein, which is editing and montage. So in terms of individual, f uh, um, the spots in individual frames, as, uh, as opposed to like, if there is any uh, blank spots in between, say, frames or in between series of frames. Mm -hmm. So if you can address um, sure. like the, the mobility of, of the relationship between spectatorship and subjectivity. Um, yes, um, it's, it's, a, I mean, it's, a, it's a question that I've thought a lot about. Uh, and uh, what, I, what, I, what I presented here in a way is, is something that wanted to transcend uh, thinking of cinema as a kind of isolated form of, of projecting uh, subjectivities, uh, forms of memory and forms of imagination. Um, for, I think for, a, and, and I provocatively in a sense I put it together in relation to the museum because these two spaces are often thought of as completely separate and different, and they are. Um, so what I'm doing in a sense is comparing something by, um, and you're right to point to the difference as well as the, uh, as the comparison, but the comparison was important to me because in the history of film theory, uh, the question of subjectivity and the question of spectatorship has been, I think, too much addressed uh, in relation to uh, the opticality and the specificity of the visual language of film. Uh, there's been too much uh, talk about editing, uh, too much uh, about the, the form of visuality, uh, which has been very, very important in understanding film as an apparatus, the whole theory of cinema as a kind of apparatus of subjectivity. But I think for me the limit, having been one of the people who has uh, traversed uh, and even produced some of these ideas, uh, the limit was that this notion of subjectivity as related to visuality did not take into consideration other forms, uh, other senses, and other forms in which the creation of space uh, was, uh, was related to. And that it, it put it uh, too much within the framework of understanding a language in, in isolated form. And what I wanted to do uh, somewhat, in a sense, provocatively, was to talk about something that I think Eisenstein, and I'm glad you brought him back, uh, understood when he was speaking of the language of cinema, is its connection to um, the architectural space uh, in which the language of film is projected. Yes, uh, there are frames. Certainly, there are blank spaces uh, between uh, frames. Certainly, the language of film would not exist if it wasn't for a form of difference, um, a slight difference that exists within, between and within still images. It's a product, in many ways, of an illusion of movement. Uh, the movement itself does not exist on the strip. It exists as a form of technological um, illusion that go, as it goes through a machinery and an apparatus which certainly involves the spectator. And it's not only, but what I'm arguing is it's not only a visual phenomenon, it's something that actually deeply, um, deeply involves the forms of subjectivity that go on beyond visuality. So in my book, Atlas of Emotion, basically a lot of the book is, is devoted to answering this uh, question that you have because uh, one of the things that had been forgotten in speaking about frames uh, in film or speaking about montage or speaking about sequence uh, was in fact not only the question of space but the relation between subjectivity and affects. Um, the relation, the, the connection that it exists in the creation and the making of the self, not simply as a perceptual self, a self of perception. So yes, the whole connection to Impressionism and Manet and that form of painting, that's all in there. But what I think was particularly missing uh, in that form of, of theorizing a film was the, the relation that this whole has to forms of memory, forms of imagination, and forms of affect. Uh, and affect in particular, I think, is a very, very crucial 
a, a point of, connect, of, of the making of the self and the making of subjectivity. So that's the thing that I would say in what I do uh, in many ways in my work is, is, um, is, is, uh, is particularly working with. And affect in relation to hapticity and not only optical. And that's why in a sense I'm, I'm connecting this to uh, architectural space. Um, yes, so there is a difference between the way in which we perceive the works in a museum and the way in which we perceive in the cinema. But if you look historically at the way in which, and that's why I went back into this form of public exhibition, if you look historically, in a sense, they both emerged as forms of institution that not only changed our ways of seeing, but changed our ways of existing uh, publicly in, in intimate forms of space and in intimate forms of projection. So subjectivity, not simply as a product of the eye and of perceptual change, which is, was what most of film, classical film theory, in a say, I mean classical contemporary film theory has done, but subjectivity to my mind in relation to forms of haptical relation uh, that have something to do also with a connection uh, to forms of what I like to call public intimacy. And institutionally, um, in many ways, looking at the, the, the experience of the museum was in fact not about the isolated frame. You know, the way that art history is taught is by showing one painting at the time or speaking about the work of an author. And the reason why I showed all this collection of images as forms of recollection is because what I want to do is, in a sense, mobilize this notion of memory and imagination by way of speaking in a nice and stinian way about the montage of images and the forms of looking into vitrines uh, and the collection of objects which were also cultural souvenirs, uh, not simply the great works of arts, but also manufactured, uh, things that would in fact have to be experienced, so that whoever went to a cabinet or had a cabinet of curiosity out of which the cinema exists would have to understand the montage of images that produce a form of imaginistic form of subjectivity and imagination. And I think that form was missing when, when you simply um, uh, when you simply look at cinema as a series of, of, of frames or a connection of montage. And here is where Eisenstein, in a way, came to my aid. I mean, Eisenstein is somebody that obviously understood the potential of the forms of difference and the blank spaces that happen within, within the frame. But what we also pointed out at is, is that that montage that appears to be extraordinarily cinematic is, in a sense, the form of associative in, uh, hyper, in a sense, synesthetic, imaginistic involvement that one has in which one creates the self in space, in haptic ways, in architectural space. And so what the, the piece of Eisenstein that was lesser known was the one that inspired me the most, which was this little essay on architecture and cinema, which, by the way, has not been translated uh, into English until the late 1980s, and it appeared, in an, interestingly enough, in an architecture magazine, in a design magazine, not in a film theory magazine. So film theorists did not ever speak of Eisenstein as having anything to do with this form of connection to the making of self that happens in space and in architectural space. And so, uh, in a way, what I'm presenting here, taken for granted, all of the work about perceptual and subjectivity is to, uh, is to push the theory um, towards this, this kind of direction and look, at, and look at the lesser known work of Eisenstein and how Eisenstein uh, understood montage as a form, in fact, of Im imaginative uh, reinvention of space which, which has within itself the trace of the art of memory and uh, he understood it in an architectural design form. <clears throat> Two super brief comments about the haptic and a very short question. Um, first is that um, I think the haptic um, mnemonic um, um, structure that you've given us has everything to do with design in terms of the discourse around form and function. So that, I'll just leave it at that. The second is that your comment about the sheet being hung, that's not just, I mean, of, of course, you know, I'm just elaborating on this. Um, sheets were hung in places like saloons, you know, in bars and places like that. So they were projected, so you get the negative view on the other side as well. And people would pay to look at the film from either side. So um, 
intrinsic into that experience is the sheet as a form of membrane, but also as a haptic experience. Um, and my question is actually very, very um, brief, because I, um, video projection is something that I've worked in for the last 20 years. So this is something that I always think about, um, especially when showing in a place like a gallery rather than a um, um, uh, you know, cinema. Um, and that is the time of the gallery viewer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we always, you know, you always hear that you can't really, you can't really get the attention of somebody for more than 30 seconds in this gallery time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, many of us who work with this, work in this medium, take this as a challenge. You know, take it as a challenge as to how to subvert it, how to work with it, how to, in a sense, undo it. So I just want to know if you have some comments about the time of the gallery goer versus the sort of classical imprisoned, you know, suturing that is in um, mm -hmm. film studies. Um, well, th thanks, Simon, for uh, this interesting uh, uh, question. I, I, I agree with you that the haptic has a lot to do with, with design and, and mnemonic, but also the making of the self and, and subjectivity. Uh, and, and as for your comment about uh, the sheet, that's very interesting to me. One of the things that in a gal in a time, um, and I'm going to try to answer them together for the sake of uh, brevity. One of the projects that I have in mind. Uh, for the, the visual fabrics book is in fact to, uh, to do a kind of historical um, theorization of how this sheet uh, has then changed into the kind of screen uh, that imprisoned the spectator. Um, one of the, the early essays that I, that I, that I wrote uh, about trying to mobilize the filming spectator was called Street Walking Around Plato's Cave. Um, the idea, uh, and this was before uh, there was moving image installation or even digital technology, I kind of had a sense, and, and this has been haunting me for a long time, that the classical spectator of cinema who's imprisoned in a chair, cannot move, has to, has to subject to the hour and a half time, was a sort of something that happened at a certain point in the history of cinema. And what I want to do, in fact, by going uh, to the, uh, connecting the post-cinema to the pre-cinema to show that, in fact, the earlier ways of spectating and exhibiting had a lot more to do with less time, a time that was not, uh, that was not forced upon the spectator, much like the gallery time um, in many ways, which you could stay there for an hour or three seconds. And so it is the challenge of the artist, as you say, in a sense, to go against the idea that as a spectator, you're only going to stay for three minutes and push the time limits. But in many ways, when you think about the first cinemas, they were hanging things in everywhere, in every possible public space. So you had something that's very close to the screen that you have today, which you could see from both sides, where you don't have necessarily behind the, not, you know, behind the, the, the spectator just as a frontal Renaissance perspective, ideal, bodiless self, but you actually have an embodied form of public subjectivity that moves around the space. Um, m most of the early cinemas were, were also at street level. Um, so you walked the, the city streets, the pavement, you walked in, you looked at something, you came out. The connection, very much like in relation to what the, uh, I'm sorry, what was your name that you were talking about, Pudon, the artist, before? Uh, in a sense, this transition between inside and outside uh, that you have in some of these projections, like Krzysztof Wodichko's, existed in a way in the potentiality of the history of film before it became dominant film language. Uh, so I actually think there's less of a, of a divide than most uh, film theorists and, uh, who are terrified of the death of cinema. Um, and as for the time, I mean, I think also that is, is in a way an interesting question because the time of the feature film dictated the time you stay in a movie theater. Uh, but that if you look at all of the other forms of, of relation to time, the duration of the loop could be forever continuous in the early films as it could be the three seconds. And, and I think some of the most interesting artists are actually playing with that. Um, I'm always curious when I go to see like an Isaac Julian installation, people stay. You know, they don't stay two seconds. They actually sit on the floor, they watch it. They, so the, it's, I, I think this whole idea of, of saying that there is a very short time span 
is, is a real problem. And, and the sense of duration as long durée is, is coming back, uh, I think, as a, as a kind of response to too much simultaneity and too much shortness. Uh, I, I recently saw something in Berlin, this installation of Janet Cardiff, in, in which was, I was amazed. I mean, the young people were who were not looking at their, uh, at their iPhones, they were not emailing, they were not like having 37 things, they just like everybody turned everything off and stayed. And it was a challenge of Janet Cardiff to put people in a position of immersion in a space in which, in which was sound that was creating this form of soundscape. Hey, Simon, I'm sorry, uh, we have to move on. Uh, you can talk later. Uh, uh, Gabby? This is a follow-up on uh, your remarks on projecting sub subjectivities, and perhaps I want to open them up a little to some of the more general discussions we had in the last few days, and start with Akbar's question whether memory is material or immaterial. In a sense, we always have something like embedded memories, and we need something like mnemonic objects in order to trigger memories. Mm -hmm. Now, we could look at a lot of the material that you presented to us in terms of a collective yes. archive yes. of emergent subjectivities. Yes. Uh, but uh, then uh, I think it's also interesting to think about the difference between designed memory spaces, like um, the ones you showed us uh, that we could call voluntary memories, voluntary designs, if we use mm -hmm. the old Proustian distinction. And we have long discussions about the role of the courtyard in Nin Ying's film mm -hmm. as a materialized memory. Mm -hmm. But this morning also, the house of this uh, old arm gentleman um, a museum of personal meanings. <laughs> uh, and on the other side, there are a lot of memory objects that become catalysts for involuntary memories. Yes. And that's a projection of subjectivities yes. that works largely unconsciously. And I think in order to bring both of them together, um, we need to look much more closely at the transference between art and spectators because a lot of that transference works at a subliminal level. Uh, there's this great essay by, by Margaret Duras, In the Dark, in, the dark, in which yeah. she precisely uh, mm -hmm. talks about these things. And I think a lot work with analogical triggers. Uh -huh. Eisenstein's montage yes. is an example. I think tomorrow we will see the work of Chen Dunking, where I think a lot works with these unconscious transferences that he translates into montages. And I think why I emphasize this um, is uh, to encourage us to look at art not just as an archive of collective memories or of projected subjectivities, but also as a transformational object that mobilizes memory and affect in spectators and becomes truly transformational in change. We are affected by it. And this uh, relates directly to what you said about hapticity, about being touched and being moved mm -hmm. also transforms us. And in this respect, it's interesting is that Winnicott, who uh, talked about transitional spaces transitional and objects, dynamics yes. of mirroring, he insisted against Lacan yes. not to just look at mm -hmm. mirroring in terms of seeing, mm -hmm. but that mm -hmm. also in terms of touching and being touched. Yeah. That's well, just this is more a, a comment a than a question. Um, no, it's I can't comment. answer that quickly. <laughs> uh, of course not. I, but I think in a sense you provided uh, the answer to the previous question about subjectivity. I mean, a lot of, of um, um, 
of, of the way in which I understand this connection um, between uh, subjectivity and, and projection has to do with, with affects. I mean, an atlas of emotion in a way, this relation between motion and emotion. The idea was precisely what you point out to, that this, this collective archive of emerging subjectivities that I'm showing here is not something voluntary or in, it's, it's, it's something that works with, the, with a kind of unconscious that relates also very, very deeply, and that's why I call it public intimacy, deeply to a form of transformative movement uh, within the self. And, and I mean, I didn't elaborate on, any, on much of those images, but in a sense, the image of magic lantern affects that I showed were interesting to me precisely because the idea was to speak of the movement of cinema as a transformative motion, which could actually really intimately and publicly, so politically, subjectively, and politically at the same time, something not separate, where the private in many ways is much, much related in a way to a form of, of social transformation of intersubjectivity is deeply related to a form of to a form of motion. That's why I insist on motion and emotion, I insist on affects uh, and, and, and uh, tran in, as a form of transport. And transport to me means not, not only means of transportation, but forms of, of, of transition and forms of materialization. And one last thing about, um, I, I mean, I didn't answer uh, uh, Akbar's question about memory as being material or immaterial, I think it's both. Uh, and I mean, to a certain extent, the objects that trick, I mean, the objects in the cabinets of curiosity that trigger our memories are also forms of imagination. So they're forms that not only, they don't take us just back to the past, they project in themselves the forms of imagining selves uh, for the future. So it's forms of assemblages and transformation that have something to do with the material thing itself. But I also think that the material thing itself changes through time. I mean, in Proust, the object is the Madeleine. Uh, now you can say it's a photograph, it, or probably it's no longer even a photograph. But in many, many ways, it has to, to my mind, it always has to do with an object of design. So architecture and, and design plays an important part in that. Thank you. Travis? Okay, all right, please. So a question, um, as I was looking at the art installations that you began with and you ended with, I was thinking to myself, you know, what locate, what's specific about these particular things that you've been drawn to to show us? And I think by thinking about that will help us to think about how that is specific in relation to maybe something that we could see that's linked to Shanghai, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and what, the way I saw you locating it was going, make, create, creating a kind of genealogy, mm -hmm. going back to the pre-cinema to early cinema, um, and which is one way of locating it. So if I wanted to follow that, then the question I have is, there are other kinds of genealogies to go back to if you're going to go with medium, which would be video, for example, or the digital, right? And the, uh, with both video and digital come all these particular pr as history of practices and histories of theorization of how memory works in relation to video, sure. in relation to digital. So I'm wondering where those different you know, technologies work within, or mediums work within your notion of cinema mm -hmm. in relation to these pieces yes. that you've chosen to show us today. Um, uh, that's also a very uh, vast question. I'll try to answer that uh, briefly. Yes, it is a genealogy in a way that Foucault talks about it. No, so something that in many ways is not uh, it's an archaeology of, of knowledge of minor savoirs rather than uh, something that is uh, intended to speak of history or memory as a form of nostalgia for a different art. Um, I, and it has, a, it has obviously, it has a certain, I think that gen, there's multiple genealogies inherent to Foucault's ideas of genealogies that you don't have a totalizing unique way to think of it. I don't think it, there's only one way to think of memory uh, and this is the only way to do it. It's just that uh, I'm working with it and I also believe that when you do something uh, transdisciplinary work you have to be extremely rigorous. Uh, so I did this, this is very specific, it's not like I threw images just because they came in through my head. Uh, and association is, is an art form and, and I think it's a form of pure theory, poor theory and pure theory in some way. So what I did here is to take um, 
to take something which is historically connected, cinema and the museum, and travel my way within that form of genealogy to explain a form of mobilization of space, which to my mind was both material and virtual, which worked with forms of transformative subjectivities and interconnected haptic to forms of transformation of affects. I, I could have chosen another way. Uh, and it would have been another journey that I could have or would have and might have wanted to take you into. Uh, I, don't like to, uh, I don't like to necessarily think that uh, you throw the kitchen sink into something. You, I, I work my genealogies extremely carefully. That said, uh, very often when I speak at film conferences, film, people accuse me of, of not, an, of, um, in a sense, using a kind of digital type of spectator when talking about cinema. Is that uh, I, when I, in many ways, my, I mean, Atlas of Emotion consciously uh, and my talk also consciously stayed out of speaking about digital technology because I did not want to necessarily confuse the two matters since I was talking about a specific trajectory. But there is no question to my mind that the form of uh, mobilized uh, subjectivity and affect of which I speak in my work is something that's deeply uh, and, and perhaps unconsciously influenced by something even before I knew it. You know, I mean, in a sense, I, uh, I, uh, when I wrote Street Walking Around Plato's Cave, there was no such thing as digital technology. But if you read that essay, you somehow realize that my model of spectatorship has very little to do with the imprisoned spectator of Plato's Cave who's looking at an illusionary form of images, but it's a kind of mobile, short attention span spectator that walks uh, into a digital space. So. Um, my theories have been, in a sense, appropriated very much by both artists and theorists who have done work uh, with it in, in that space, but I, I didn't want to go there because I feel like I also, I, I talk about things when in, in, a, in a certain kind of, of circle, uh, you know, so this is not the way, it's one way to think of it, but in that form of, mob, I mean, I'm very suited in a way, the reason why I can move easily into speaking about contemporary art installation, not only am I not threatened by it, but I'm very interested in it, unlike many other people who work in film who just think of this as the death of everything they've done in their entire life, is precisely because I, I, it connects very much to what I think is within the potential of cinema. And that, that's why post-cinema and pre-cinema to me, rather than the dominant film spectator uh, and everything that came afterwards. You know? so. Okay, on that note, we'll have to end today's very interesting session. <laughs> Thank you, Julia. Thank you.